we'll try to make this as conversational as possible. And uh, I will ask if folks can hold questions towards the end, that'd be great. Uh, feel free to add questions as we start this update and presentation in the chat. And I'll try to make sure that we can get through all of them today. Uh, and if not, you know, I I put my cell phone everywhere, so I will definitely putting, I'll be putting my cell phone and my uh, email address in the chat so folks will have access to it. We'll go ahead and get started. I think we'll have someone be joining us hopefully here soon, Alejo Peña Soto, who is one of our student advocates who is very active during the legislative session, hopefully to provide some of the, oh, there he is. Um, to provide a student perspective on, uh, on this unfortunate goings on. And we unfortunately have a update. Uh, we just maybe good timing in a sense, but uh, Governor Abbott did announce not only with the signing of House Bill 3979 that he was gonna be adding um, banning of critical race theory to the special session call. So we'll be discussing timeline and what that may look like in the next couple of months. Uh, so there's a lot of unprecedented, unprecedented um, movement that's around this bill and this subject, but we'll also talk about some other things as it pertains to what looks like a national trend uh, and these quote unquote anti-critical race theory situations and bills and resolutions. Um, if Christina, could you go ahead and start sharing your screen and we'll start going through the presentation. Thank you. And as we wait for that, I will introduce myself. My name is Ana Ramon. I'm the Deputy Director of Advocacy at IDRA and had the unfortunate pleasure of <laughs> leading some of our coalition efforts against this bill. If you go up to the very top right-hand corner, Christina, there's the present slide. There you go. And then you just click present. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we had a, a very large and diverse coalition pushing up against this and we'll talk through timelines, some of our initial wins, but uh, also some of the major items that are now within this legislation, which will be in law uh, come September 1. And then also maybe some unfortunately upcoming needs around a special session and uh, potentially curriculum and social studies uh, curriculum conversations with the State Board of Education. So this is part one of our policy series at IDRA, we're calling it a policy summer camp. And uh, unfortunate good timing, right? Uh, we just got this news yesterday that, uh, the, that Governor Abbott is now adding um, anti anti um, critical race theory, as he says it, uh, we know it's much more expansive than that uh, to the call, and we'll talk about that. But want to go through our agenda first, um, and then introduce my my co-host Alejo, um, who will be helping us also work through some of the updates and information. Uh, so we'll be talking uh, first about the key elements that's in the bill. We'll also be going over what was removed and some of the subsequent um, pushback and procedural moves we were successful in during the legislative session. I think it's going to be important to uh, unfortunately look at what was removed because it could end up in a subsequent special session bill, which we'll discuss uh, along with maybe some other elements that could be added from some of the national dialogues we're seeing around these quote unquote critical race theory bills. Um, so we'll be talking about that. Really wanna look at some of the potential effects in the classroom and concerns. And I'm really excited Alejo is here to help guide that conversation as well. Really uh, going through the timeline and changes, I think will be helpful. There was a lot of confusion around this uh, piece of legislation. At one point, it was even dead. <laughs> it was dead for four hours. That was a wonderful um, four hours for us and would love to kind of share those moments and share lessons learned. Um, and the nationwide movement, I think is gonna be helpful for us to, to dive into and have a dialogue around, especially as we know now, this is going to be um, 
uh, another issue brought up during a special session, having a state, a nationwide look at what could be coming to Texas, I think will be really helpful for us in kind of building our needs and um, next steps. And that's will be our last agenda item is looking at the special session, potentially when it could take place, what needs and interventions we could be looking at, and then also looking at the SBOE and needs around the State Board of Education and really trying to hammer out those next steps. So um, a little context for that last picture and you don't have to go back, but, um, oh, thanks. So um, that's Senator West. And I think this is very indicative of where we're at as a state. Senator West was discussing the Confederate Monument Bill in 2019. And he point very justly and poetically to a huge, as you can tell, monument of the Confederacy that stands behind him as one of the only two black members of the state Senate. So I always point to this. It um, reminds me of what we're up against and, but also who our champions are and who we can call on and um, the unfortunate political and um, just general landscape of Texas and where we're at. But wanted to give some context to that. It's a pretty famous photo at this point and it speaks unfortunately volumes to the landscape and where we're going to be up against headed into now what's going to be a special, a special session fight and a state board of education fight. Thank you for going back, Christina. So first we want to discuss the key elements that are within the bill and I will also here highlight um, some of the elements that didn't make it right. Thankfully, at least for now. So, uh, and we'll go, we'll go actually section by section. So there was a pretty uh, extensive amount that was added to what's now in code, right? I think what's good to clarify here is this is, and I'm going to be saying unprecedented quite a bit. <laughs> I think anyone who's familiar with this is pretty tired of this word, but unfortunately, in an, in an unprecedented move, this is the first time, at least in um, the experts that we talked to, the state of Texas, the legislature itself, has decided to write curriculum standards. Um, we were pretty shocked at how um, extensive it was, how deliberate it was, um, to be frank, how racist it was, the conversations around um, the different elements that were in this bill. And we'll talk about some of the house and floor fights that took place. But one of the most extensive pieces that's actually very, very different from other states is the section that includes all of now the curriculum that the State Board of Education has to um, actually create standards for. A lot of it is already in the TEKS, and I think this is going to be an interesting discussion headed into, um, this is going to be an interesting discussion headed into a State Board of Education curriculum uh, rewrite, right, as we know is going to be coming up in the next couple of years. But there was a lot of amendments added, and we'll discuss that on the House side um, when that debate took place. So pretty extensive, very interesting, a lot of um, pretty intense dialogue during that debate, but has now really set it apart from a lot of legislation across the country. So that is very new and different in the sense that it's in code, not necessarily not in the sense that it's not already in the TEKS and the standards. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The current events and widely debated topic, um, talk a little bit more about that and what it was at one point. At one point, that provision itself was um, not only for social studies curriculum, but actually for all K through 12. So we'll talk a little bit about that and unfortunately what that may mean for legislative intent for any future legislation or what could be coming up during a special session. Uh, the coursework and credit um, for students and limiting or actually barring um, extra credit from teachers for students. Uh, I think this really speaks to, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about this, the fact that this is not about critical race theory, right? This bill is so much more than that. And we had some pretty good dialogue with um, not only our media partners, but our coalition partners, our legislators, right? This bill is truly the whitewashing of history. 
and the whitewashing of our curriculum and the whitewashing and overreach into our classrooms. This was very clearly one of those items um, that pointed to that and who they were trying to limit and taking part in not only um, their education, but also <laughs> in just basic uh, ability to be a student and to take part in much more outside of the classroom. Um, there are several concepts that are prohibited in the social studies courses. Um, this was a, a direct shot at the 1619 project. To happy to, we'll be talking about a little of the dialogue that took place with that amendment and that provision. Uh, the funding proposals, there's varying um, degrees of this across the country. So we'll talk a little bit about that, of course. And um, then there's the implementation provisions and some additional provisions we'll discuss. But wanted to do a quick overview. We'll be doing a deeper dive into each of these and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, before we get started though, and I meant to, I'm so sorry, I didn't get to introduce them sooner. Alejo, if you could come off mute and introduce yourself. Alejo was with us, unfortunately, day one. <laughs> um, and he attended a meeting with the speaker the speaker's office to explain the student concerns and what that could mean and has been um, a champion against this bill and really excited for him to also share what the student perspective will be and moving forward. So Alejo, feel free to introduce yourself. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Hey, uh, my name's Alejo. I uh, just graduated from high school um, and I've been doing work uh, in student activism and advocacy at the Capitol now for uh, a few months, but in, at the local level in San Antonio um, for the past couple years. And um, yeah, super excited, but not excited to be able to share this time with you all um, and just kind of uh, give a little insight into what that experience was like uh, working with them and also what it kind of means uh for students and and what we're planning on doing about it so yeah thanks for having me thank you Alejo. so we can go ahead and go back to the next slide so this is one of the most expansive parts of the bill it talks about a lot of the amendments that were added on during the House floor debate. Um, this is when we had a really robust conversation about what is um, white supremacy, what is racism, what are the founding documents, or the founding documents based in racism, um, based in slavery explicitly. This was a very tough but necessary conversation that took place on the House side. I want to thank a lot of our coalition members at the time who helped us equip um, the legislators and friendly offices with 21 amendments, with talking points, with questions. We knew we were going to have a fight and we needed to expose what this bill was and how ugly and how truly racist um, this legislation is out and very much outside what they're saying the scope of critical race theory is, right? This bill is much more than that. It is again, the whitewashing of history. So several amendments got on and like we mentioned, this is now requiring the State Board of Education to include these concepts into the state social study curriculum standards. This is, or the TEKS, this is very, very different than any other state. It was actually even mentioned on a national call we were on. Um, this is that one part where we're really um, got, got some offensive, uh, offensive in the sense offensive wins in, not offensive, offensive wins into the bill. So this includes, you know, the history of Native Americans. It includes the founding documents um, are expanded to include the Lincoln Douglas debates, the Federalist Papers, but also the Book of ne Negroes, the Fugitive Slave Act, the Indian Removal Act, Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist, which is also, it goes into a few other subjects outside of race. And then William Still's Underground Railroad records. These were uh, wins in a sense against a really ugly bill when say it was a total win. And in no way did we think that any amendment was gonna make this better. Our point of all of the coalition work was to make sure that this bill died as it did for a very short period of time. 
Um, but there's also the inclusion of documents around the Chicano movement, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement, the Snyder Act, the American labor movement. It's it's literally tense, actually, I'm trying to look at the sections right now. It's a, it's 13 sections of different items that have to be added into the curriculum. And we assume that this is one of the sections that Governor Abbott had the most heartburn about, <laughs> as it doesn't really align with a lot of the national bills that are being filed as it pertains to quote unquote critical race theory, but highlights so explicitly that this is based on race. This is based on the whitewashing of history. And this section now is going to force the State Board of Education to take up these new additions into the standards. New in the sense, again, I wanna clarify for anyone that was, was able to jump on a little late, that this is not new to what's already in curricula, right? This is new to what's actually in code. So again, this is unprecedented in the fact that the state legislature has never, and to at least our knowledge, right? Maybe, maybe prior to my knowledge, has never actually wrote curriculum out for any subject for that matter. So um, we're, we'll be sure to drop, and I'm not sure if someone has it handy, but we'll be sure to drop what um, House Bill 3979 does. It's a wonderful document that Morgan, our National Director of Policy, worked on and put together. It had several iterations of it, and um, we're trying to share this out so people know what's in uh, the bill as it is and what was just signed by the governor um, on the 15th of this month. Uh, go ahead to the, the next slide. Alejo, is there anything you'd like to add as it pertains to that before we move on? Um, no, yeah, I think the only thing that is like worth noting in terms of the additional stuff that was added to the bill was kind of how um, visible, uh, visibly racist and just sexist the process was when drafting amendments and, and kind of seeing how clear in terms of what the goal of the actual legislation was, right? When um, we started noting issues with of sexism, of, of different forms of prejudices in some of the incorporated founding documents that um, you know were proposed initially in the bill, instead of right um, really taking a look at that, uh, what some of the uh, House Republicans decided to do was instead. Um, get rid of provisions in the bill that um, that advocated for um, equal rights uh, and advocated uh, for uh, essentially what the bill was supposed to do, which was eliminate uh, racial or sexual uh, prejudice towards one group of people. Um, so yeah, that's just always uh, still crazy to me that that uh, that happened. But yeah, that's really it. Yeah. No, it was. Um... It was night and day, I think, and some of the folks on this call probably participated in some of our rounds of meetings with mainly Republican, um, moderate Republicans who were trying to just essentially get a litmus test and understand where things were. And a lot of them told us and very quietly said that they wouldn't vote for it. We heard that from members on the floor as well. They didn't want to vote for this bill. Um, but they still did, right? You're a no until it hits the floor is what we said, uh, but it speaks to the controversial nature of it. It speaks to honestly the true intent of the bill, which Alejo just laid out was targeting uh, communities of color and uh, gender and race. And it was really, um, while we are very proud of the fight we put up on the House floor and the Senate floor, it's heartbreaking at the same time because uh, we knew what the eventual outcome was, but uh, it just, it's hard to watch a very overt conversation about racism take on, take, be taken on by what is supposed to be a deliberative body that's supposed to be representative of all communities. So then to go into the next topic, we're seeing uh, this in a few other states as well, which is the, um, not, or the barring of teachers to be compelled or discuss current events or widely debated and currently controversial issues in um, social studies courses and curriculum. Um, what this section says is like a teacher who chooses to discuss a current event or widely debated and currently controversial issue of public shall, right? So this is very um, hard language, right? This is not permissive language. This is language that says a teacher has to do this. 
to their ability, strive to explore a topic from diverse and contending perspectives. One of the most eloquent and most heartfelt, at least for me, uh, issues that was brought up that would essentially be not aligned with this is when Senator um, um, Blanco from El Paso talked about how if a student brought up the fact that there was a shooting in El Paso based on race, which is a current and controversial issue as it pertains to gun rights and race relations, and even for an ISD like Clint ISD that lost a student to this, how were they expected now to not to have or to not have that conversation within the classroom, right? Classrooms take on so much more. It's a deliberative space, right? That's supposed to be representative of all members of the community and all students. And now this would bar that kind of conversation or they would have to have a deliberation of both sides. So um, I don't know if anyone watched the floor debate, there was actually an amendment that would have um, opted the insurrection out, for example, to say like, why would we have both sides deliberated? Uh, that was voted down and there was conversations like that, right? There was even, and I'm, I'm not familiar with the language, but there was even an amendment that was specifically about uh, excluding the Holocaust in this, in some of these sections. And that was also not accepted by the author. So it just really shows like now if something comes up around you know, you could say something as controversial as well, controversial in the sense like 9-11 or terrorism or the Holocaust, right? This really is such a crazy, <laughs> I'm not even sure how else to describe it, crazy provision that anything, and maybe it could be weaponized in a sense by people who want to teach on certain subjects that they haven't been able to before, but this is going to be a very interesting section and in how it's actually implemented, but also very scary in the sense that it could definitely be weaponized against teachers um, who are just trying, right, to be very explicit about the truth and teaching the truth about racism and um, gender equ equity and other topics within their classrooms. So, Alejo, is there anything you'd like to add regarding this section from your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, just like it's, it makes you really think of where uh, the future or what the future of curriculum for students looks like in Texas and also just nationwide considering what just happened in, uh, you know, in the National Senate and in our U.S. Senate with Juneteenth and how is that going to be incorporated into into our curriculum now? I don't know. Um, and it's especially sad con considering how far uh, curriculum has come, right? It's obviously not perfect. Um, but, you know, even from when I was in first grade, um, I was Hernan Cortez in first in my first grade play. And I think we've come a long way since that. And it's really sad to know that, you know, for students who are just starting their journey, um, not being able to know what their journey is going to look like because of how limited it, it may be in terms of what what we're able to talk about as students and also just with our teachers. I think that's a really important part of having a relationship with the teachers, being able to discuss those things. And you kind of lose that um, with this bill potentially. Exactly, thank you, Alejo. Again, another, and the way that I describe this section is very much a clear attack on students and teachers yet again, right? This would uh, bar teachers and not, not allow, they may not be required to make part of a course. So again, this is, there has been some conversations about, oh, this is implicit language and they're just guidelines. But in my understanding of code, and again, I've been now, this is my fifth le Texas legislative session. I know how to read code, right? <laughs> when I see a may not, that is not implicit. That is a hard line that teachers will have to follow, make part of a course or award a course grade or credit, including extra credit for a student's political activism, lobbying or efforts to persuade members of the legislative or executive branch at the federal, state or local level. And also this includes participation in internships, practicums and similar activity involving social or public policy advocacy. This is, um, 
not only from the student perspective, but also from like the business side and advocacy organizations like ourselves, like this is heartbreaking, right? I know that when I was a student, I was offered credits to attend rallies or to go to my like local, um, local government, you know, and go participate in city council. What does this mean for that, right? There's so many unknowns around how and whom this is going to affect everyone from our business community to our advocates to our students. And this is something that I know a lot of our coalition members were very concerned about because essentially, you know, if you look even from like, let's look at this from a business perspective, what business doesn't have, you know, a political or a lobby arm, right? Any major corporation, any Fortune 500 company, any chamber of commerce, right, is going to have some form of lobbying, right? And to have, I know I have met with hundreds of students in the Capitol who have come to help support a bill or legislation they're working on. I think a lot of people familiar in San Antonio with David's Law, for example, which was to help combat cyberbullying. I know of several students I met with to come and, and actually lobby, right, for this piece of legislation. So um, those are going to be some um, difficult conversations to have in the classroom and what teachers can and cannot do and how it's going to affect students. Uh, Alejo, is there anything you'd like to add pertaining to this section? Um, I mean, yeah, just kind of reiterating, like I was receiving service hours while at the Capitol doing the work on this bill um, specifically. And so it's just like hard to imagine how students are gonna be able to participate in extracurriculars um, in different things like that. And even in terms of how schools function and operate, uh, right? My school has an international baccalaureate program um, and right, it incorporates uh, current events into its curriculum. And so, you know, it's not certain yet what that looks like for a school like my school, um, but our school receives funding because of that. We receive all sorts of things because of that. And when that is potentially put in jeopardy, it makes you kind of wonder how our schools uh, and students going to be able to um, just like thrive and be able to 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 continue uh, with life with a, a prepared sense of kind of going into the world. And so that's yeah, just really really heartbreaking. Thank you, Lejo. We're seeing a lot of these provisions um, across the country as well, really targeting what teacher training looks like. Uh, so in this section, it lays out how a teacher or an administrator or other employee of a school district an open room charter may not, again, may not be required to engage in training orientation or, ther or therapy that presents any form of race or sex stereotyping or blame on the basis of race or sex. Um, I imagine anyone in the administra in administration or has worked in ISDs understands, right, this is beyond uh, what anything <laughs> pertaining to critical race theory could mean, right? This is diversity and inclusion. This is multi-year grants. This is the opportunity to continue to make sure that we have effective and, you know, encompassing pedagogy that is protective of our students, right, of all race, sex, gender, um, and protected, you know, protected classes, right? This is a direct attack on any kind of work that would make sure that we have safe and inclusive classrooms. So this was, again, the different in the Senate version. I'm curious to see if we see any copycats coming up um, from different parts of the country and in a special session, right? As we're unfortunately know that this topic is gonna be taken up. Um, there's some states that have, I believe it was like provisions around actually, you know, being able to accept funding, right? Or accept any kind of monies. I know that um, in the Senate version, it was a little bit different, essentially not allowing the training of teachers by other teachers or other admin. It was going to force uh, different kind of standards or ways that this was going to take place. So we're going to be on the lookout at anything or changes to this section, I think particularly during a special section, as we know, it's this, this unfortunate conversation that's only growing in other parts of the country as part of this national movement. Um, 
before we move on, and Alejo, feel free to jump in, but we can move on if, if you're good. Okay. So this is a pretty extensive section as well. So this outlines that teachers, administrators, employees, et cetera, uh, even uh, of a state agency, right, may not require or make part of a course that has any particular, as like specific concept. So this includes like one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. An individual by virtue of the individual race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, oppressive, whether consciously or subconsciously, like this is a very extensive section. It seems, I guess, to be a response to what some assume critical race theory is, which again is a theory very much in academia and really understanding how, you know, this country has been built on racism and slavery. Uh, so this really speaks to what I see as um, a response to a fear of black and brown communities, right? Like one of the conversations that struck me very deeply was when I was discussing this with a student, their response was, what are they afraid of? Who are they afraid of? Are they afraid of the angry black and brown students who are going to punish them, right? There's just so many um, difficult conversations that this is sparking and really speaks to the true nature of this bill, right? This bill isn't about critical race theory. It's not about a theory that was started some decades ago with good purpose, right? To really highlight how ugly the truth is of our country, um, but to instead, right, oppress and maintain white supremacy within our classrooms. And this section, right, the prohibit that prohibits these conversations, right? Prohibits these opportunities to include in courses, right? The truth of our country, that it was built on slavery, that it was built on um, inequity, right? Like, so this is going to be, um, I think a question a lot of will be around like social studies standards, social studies curriculum, how this will affect um, individuals who are within the classroom and how they can and cannot teach or how they can and cannot learn, right? Again, that huge overreach into our classrooms. So it's um, very concerning. And this is a section that we'll be watching as it's implemented, right? I think that's another discussion we'll have when we're looking at needs is implementation and what rulemaking authority may look like or what kind of ramifications may come from this section. But um, it's, you know, it's answer to a problem that doesn't exist, right? And as is this entire bill, but this really puts the stamp on it. Alejo, is there anything you'd like to add before we move on? Not really for this one. I think we're good. Here we'll talk about just a, a few other additions before we head to the next uh, section. And this is almost hilarious if it wasn't so harmful. There was a section of the bill that would prohibit any addition of the 1619 project into courses or curriculum. I can tell you we asked, we had a question asked of the author on the House side and I believe the Senate side like, have you, do you know of any IST that has 16, the 1619 project or critical race theory in your curriculum? And there, there's no response. As was said very eloquently by the president of the Texas Social Studies Council, there is no time, right? Of course, can it be used to inform, right? And help make sure that we're teaching the truth? Absolutely. But is it actually a part of the curriculum? No, the standards are there, the teaks are there. We, we have to teach to the teaks and the standards. This provision is completely theater, right? Aside from the fact that it will unfortunately cause an absolute cooling effect. And again, additional stressors on the teachers who are now being faced to implement, quote unquote, all of these provisions within the classroom. Sorry, I'm like, these are heavy size, excuse me. Um, 
This is one that we know a lot of philanthropic groups were concerned about, um, commun business communities were concerned about, and what we're seeing in other parts of the country. So school districts may not accept private funding for certain purposes. Those purposes include, you know, curriculum materials, um, just information around courses and extra credit. And then also talks about the subsection, which includes um, required curriculum and outlines again, right, that this course cannot include like information as it pertains to like political activism, lobbying efforts, et cetera. It's really, um, again, an, a response to a problem that doesn't exist. In our conversations with Republican offices, we were told that this provision needed to be in the bill because lobbyists were coming in and forcing books and curriculum on them. We don't know of any instance where that is actually true. Uh, we've not heard, right? I would say anecdotally, not to say that it hasn't taken place, but it just, again, seemed to be a clear, a clear solution with no problem. And the last section um, that we'll discuss today is just that students um, may not be punished, right? We know that what's what's very fearful for us is anything like this can obviously be weaponized in our classrooms um, against students, right? If some, for unfortunately, like a student decided to, you know, break one of these tenants and then it was used and weaponized against them, as we know in all of our understandings of disciplinary actions, this would overtly affect um, black and brown children, right, specifically black children and students. So this was an amendment we were able to maintain in the bill, again, with the understanding that we never thought an amendment would make the bill better. Um, and we wanted the bill to die from day one, but it was just a fail safe that we wanted to ensure stayed in the bill, that way students wouldn't be targeted unnecessarily, especially as students are now gonna have tough conversations and be in classrooms locked in with teachers who will be making really difficult decisions, whether or not to follow this law or to teach what they consider the truth. So um, we're hopeful that this has good intentions. It's something that we're gonna be watch watching very closely during the implementation process and any subsequent changes that could be made during special session. Uh, but it was it was something that we were just glad to see get in, but in no way or means makes the bill better. Yeah, and I think just real quickly for that point too, um, in terms of not punishing students, it, this bill won't um, necessarily lead to any um, disciplinary disciplinary action in from schools. Um, right, but it's like the ripple effects of you know, students not being able to learn this. Now, students are going to be organizing around this um, in terms of uh, different forms of uh, protests and stuff like that, where, you know, now it's outside of the schools and it's you wonder, would that be happening if our school system was actually teaching what it should be teaching? Um, I know, you know, in my experience at school in terms of um, organizing uh, demonstrations, it, the, the tightrope of not being disciplined is already super tight. Um, and it's just going to make it even harder for students when right, they have a right to be angry at not being able to learn about their history. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. And before we move on, I would like to discuss a few provisions that didn't make it, but we're going to be very watchful of. Um, as Alaho was mentioning there in a little earlier in our conversation, the enforcement piece is very much a question mark in the version of the bill that, and we'll discuss how it, it came to be, but in the version of the bill that we killed, which was the Senate version, there was a TEA provision that would have allowed enforcement. And from our understanding, enforcement could look everything like an audit from TEA of curriculum to like 
individual teacher repercussions, individual in administrator repercussions, all the way to the actual revoking of funding, just that already is within the TEA's rulemaking authority. So that was a very scary provision that fortunately, at least for now, is not within the bill, but was very clearly aligned with their intent and how they wanted it to be enforced. They want these provisions to be enforced because as Alejo was mentioning, we have during the debate, right, during the couple months that we were very focused on this, we had heard that there were students, that there were teachers, there were school districts even, right, who were looking at this and putting up their defenses and saying, we're going to teach the truth and we're not going to follow this bill. So the enforcement mechanism was something that was very concerning to see, but at least for now, we were lucky to keep it out of the bill that was signed by the governor. Um, the other items that didn't make it that I think are of note is there was a civics academy. While on face value, I don't think there's, and I'm saying this for me personally, I won't speak for IDRA, that a civics academy is in good faith. But from what we understood from our conversations with legislative offices, specifically um, Republican leadership, is that they were going to just essentially use the civics academies to teach how to teach this bill. So the, the civics academies were not being made in good faith. The civics academies were going to be used to just implement this legislation. Um, and then the last provision that didn't make it in, we were very happy to see, at least for now, I hate saying that, but at least for now, was this expansion, right, of the barring of talking about controversial or current events to all um, subjects K through 12, I can't imagine even, and I say this quite frequently, I can't imagine teaching a journalism class, can't imagine teaching, it, teaching an English class. There's just so many different ways that that would have had a, a profound negative impact. Um, on top of that, I know we're, we're actually relooking at what this will look like and what the different roadmaps of potential offensive and defensive changes to the standards and the TEKS look like, but a wonderful um, report that Dr. Caldera put together around the initial bill, I know we had help from Mallory, from Entrust, and a few other folks, there was 192 um, different sections at, at that point in time that were going to be affected or contradicted by the legislation itself. And I think that will only speak to and continue, right? We don't know what that looks like now. That's something we're building out, especially as this bill has um, ballooned in a sense over what it covers in code. So those are conversations we're gonna continue to have around the TEKS revisions, around what teacher discipline and citations look like, around what student discipline looks like, around what racial bullying looks like, and around what litigation and challenges looks like. You know, as Aleha was mentioning, this isn't just about what's in code, right, and what's actually enforced, which we were, you know, successful in that sense that we don't have the TA provision. However, right, this is going to have a profound impact on the actual atmosphere of what a school and classroom looks like and the discussions and the conversations and how children and students feel comfortable in their own education. So um, this is only going to continue. And I know IDRA is committed to studying the effects on the unfortunately of this bill and sharing that as we learn over what's gonna be um, a pretty long process. But I just wanted to share that and um, we'll go ahead and, and move on to our next section. So this is generally the timeline. Um, the timeline is, is a little wonky, but I think it's helpful to show and help indicate where we're at at this point. So really over a month's period is when this bill really started to take off. It was placed on the general state house calendar. For those who um, aren't as familiar with this process, the general state house calendar means that the house version of the bill was placed on the house calendar on that date. Uh, we knew we were going to have a floor fight. And um, this section in particular uh, was when we amassed and started to put together an, and implemented our internal and external strategies and building out a, a stronger coalition around this bill as it was starting to move, which at the time we were told that this bill wasn't going to move. So it was surprising when it did. And we probably should have been a little bit wiser to that. So we worked on um, 
implementing our internal strategies and our external strategies, like getting people to call and reach out to their legislators, to email their legislators and their concerns. Thank you to everyone. We did about two rounds of office visits within this period of time to try to reach out and get a litmus test to see where um, at least moderate Republicans were and um, talk to our friendly offices and champions in the building who could help get good legislative intent on the floor. So we were putting in uh, the work to get about 21 amendments filed, um, some substantive others, uh, just to really talk to uh, our concerns around the bill and what could be potential uh, legal challenges later on. So that was um, an extensive fight. And as you can tell, like, as we talked about the first section, went through uh, a litany of different amendments that got onto the bill. Then um, we continued that discussion into third reading when it finally passed the House. And then we come to our first unprecedented um, deviation from the legislative process. On the Senate side, we had been told that the Senate hearing for state affairs was going to take place on Monday. And then over the weekend and that weekend, we were told it was not. And we were going to plan for a Thursday hearing. So we were told that by several different um, trusted sources and then um, officially the bill was removed. So we made the assumption that to the rules, right? Maybe we shouldn't have listened to that, but to the rules, the bill should have come up again on Thursday of that following week. Well, that was unfortunately not the case. And what, as I've been told, an unprecedented move the Senate decided to, um, which they can do, it wasn't anything illegal, right? It was within the, the bounds of the Senate rules. They decided to um, put the bill back onto that very same day, that hearing to take up the bill without literally any prior notice. And within an hour have a hearing on a bill that we knew we had at least 30 plus people who were going to be flying in from all over the state to come and testify against. We had people and students and chamber CEOs and teachers and advocates who were gonna come in and share their concerns around what was at that point, the house version of the bill. And we weren't given that chance and many people were silenced and it was a very, it was a devastating day. I'll tell you as someone who has worked in both the Senate and the House, I personally had never seen something like that before. So I also wanna personally thank everyone who literally ran to the hardest room to find, the Betty King room, if anyone knows the Senate. And we were able to get, I think at least five people to testify against it. And just as they were closing testimony, five more people showed up. So the call was sent out, thank you for coming. And it was unprecedented in the way that they silenced voices. Um, we were honored to have our own hearing afterwards. We had a people's hearing of sorts and read individuals testimony and had a, a moment to really talk about how devastating this legislation will be to our communities, but it's not the same, right? It's not to be same. It's not the same when you're silenced by the institution that is supposed to be your representative body. Then it went to the Senate floor. Uh, this was an intense debate. Again, thankful to the senators who put up amendments, who, and then to the staff and the advocates who put together 12 pages worth of questions, really based around the legislative intent not only when it comes to the actual legality of this, but the curriculum standards, the implementation standards, everything that we knew this bill was going to be harmful to, uh, even laying out the, um, the silencing of community voices during the Senate process. Uh, it was just, um, it was, it was a long debate. And I wanna thank also those who were in our, we set up a war room similar to the house side and was trying to actively respond to the questions and, and amendments and things that were being brought up um, live during the day. So there was a lot of internal pushback and very much we relied on the strength of the coalition to get that done. Um, and then as we come to our second large legislative deviation, um, the House 
was then receives the Senate version of the bill, right, which at that point had ballooned from an, a one and a half page bill to an eight page bill, because they redid and reconfigured the language completely. So it was practically a new piece of legislation that, again, I will say this a couple of times, um, public did not have opportunity to comment on, even though it expanded, again, the curriculum, the the actual the, the standards around the curriculum and expanded um, the the topics and controversial topics that couldn't be taught in multiple in all classrooms and also the provision that include the enforcement mechanisms and what that could mean for accountability and um, when that version of the bill left the house the senate floor and then was sent back to the house we were able to kill it on a procedural move which is called a point of order which rightfully um, showed that amendments added by the Senate were not germane to the bill and outside of the initial or original topic of social studies standards in Texas or social studies curriculum in Texas. So, and I'll share this in the history of the legislature because we also did research on this. On the history of the legislature, a point of order sustained at this point in time should have killed the bill. The bill could not be revived realistically or by the rules of the House and the Senate. So for four hours, we believed that. <laughs> four hours, we thought this is correct. We've killed the bill, now we're gonna watch for other vehicles, see if language is added on, et cetera. Then we come to the third mo <laughs> unprecedented moment of, this, of the legislative process for this bill. And the bill was revived in the Senate. By what rules? There's still a lot of uncertainty around a lot of confusion around. There was a new set of rules actually introduced to the Senate called Mason's Rules of Legislative Order and Procedure, which no Senator had ever used prior um, to the debate. And if you go and back and you watch the debate, the first point of order, Senator West was recognized on, but the second point of order, they refused to recognize him, Patrick did. And they also refused to allow Senator Johnson to read into the the actual record, right? What rules the parliamentarian and the Lieutenant Governor were using to justify. Um, it was, uh, again, unprecedented. I hate using that word. I don't know if it's lost its meaning, but um, it's, it's pretty a uh, tough process to discuss, but it really highlights how explicit they were about getting this bill passed. And I'm sure a lot of folks have heard this at this point, there was some monumental conservative um, members or members of the, the donor class who were wanting this bill passed. There were phone calls made, right, to make sure that it took place and that the bill was passed and essentially were told to fix it. Um, it was uh, extraordinary in the worst possible way. Anyway, I'm trying not to, the PTSD is coming back. Um, next slide, Christina. <laughs> and now this is where we're at. So um, the bill was sent to the governor on June 1st. We had heard about concerns that the governor had, um, not explicitly, we just assumed there was, and then we also heard whispers of him potentially not signing it. We didn't know what that necessarily meant. Um, to my understanding, the governor doesn't necessarily have to sign the bill for it to be implemented. It still has a start date. Um, let's see. Oh, great. And then um, on House Bill 3979, it was signed by the governor on June 15th. That same day, and this is where now we're at and why um, we're going to need help again, um, Governor Abbott issued a statement on critical race theory and stated he was gonna add it as an item onto the next potential special session, whether that special session is in July, right? We've heard that it could be as early as July 10th. We've also heard this could be added to a special session right before the October, September special session as it pertains to redistricting. Um, so that's another rumor that's going around, but we're preparing for a July 10th special session. And, um, Last but not least, right, we're also going to have this a very similar and, this, and now another opportunity for us to weigh in, which will be around the State Board of Education, which will have to take up this standing um, curriculum, right? Cons uh, the standing curriculum that was laid out in the first section of the bill. So um, 
on next Wednesday is our first opportunity uh, to hear from the State Board of Education as to what they're planning and hopefully get some um, information from TEA as to what the process will look like. So that's going to be our upcoming and most immediate need. However, if a special session is called in early July, right, that only gives us a few weeks to really start to surmount what will have to be a um, our work as, as coalition members and additional just advocates and interested parties against this bill. Next slide, Christina. And um, as we've highlighted a little bit throughout, right, this is definitely part of a nationwide movement that's spilling into Texas. And now, unfortunately, I, I would say is being rooted in Texas, right? We've heard of similar legislation in 20 other states. Many states have passed or attempted to pass similar bills. Um, that's one resource um, through a, the AAPF.org map that actually maps some of this out. I also look at the Heritage Foundation, <laughs> see where they're mapping out, <laughs> where their um, targets are, and it's very explicitly using language from the Trump administrative, administration's executive order. We've seen some like, pretty extreme measures come up in other parts of this, the country. Um, teacher fines, right, of upwards of $5,000. Uh, also, uh, parents calling for body cameras to be put on teachers to make sure they're not teaching critical race theory in classrooms. Uh, <laughs> not that teachers don't have to deal with enough. Um, and then in, um, in, the in the Idaho version of the bill, which is I think maybe deviates from other versions is it also includes higher education institutions, right? Which there seems to be more laws that pertains to the actual protections around higher education institutions. But um, no, teachers do not get paid enough <laughs> to have body cameras strapped to them. Um, but that that is another provision that's um, pretty extreme in the sense that yes, it's a part of this movement of critical race theory bills, I can put those in quotes, but um, attacks institutions outside of the, the K through 12 uh, that we're seeing in other states. And then the introduction of federal resolutions. So Representative Dan Bishop um, has a bill like a, very explicitly just outlining critical, outlawing critical race theory. And then T Senator Tom Cotton has a bill filed that would stop the teaching of critical race theory in military, um, and so I think it was like military institutions. Um, so yeah, we're seeing these also on the federal level. This is not just in the individual states, even though um, you know we're in a different administration than we were uh, two years ago, right? When we had the Trump executive order, but uh, this is definitely spilling into Texas. And unfortunately, just to you know, just to be frank, right? In these scenarios, Texas is often the adversary of the administration in power, right? being the Biden administration. So um, one of those clear signs was on the day of the Senate debate. Uh, we also received notice that Senator, um, excuse me, um, Attorney General Paxton sent a letter with 20 other AGs saying that they would sue the Department of Education if race was included as part of like their, their standards in education. So uh, very much coordinated. <laughs> so this this is definitely uh, not just a, uh, unfortunately, not just a Texas issue. So how to get involved, right? And, and we're going to drop some links in the chat. We would love for folks to sign up as we're trying to trying to get people. I know it's summer vacation potentially, but to be engaged during July if there's a July special session. But we had some really great success in our internal and external strategies during session, right? If you're willing and able to do social media, place op-eds, you know, we were very, um, very thankful, for example, that the Star Telegram ran an op-ed from um, Dr. Althea Caldera, one of the residents, but also a fellow of ours, and really getting our messaging out, right? Um, again, the Fort Bend ISD Student Coalition uh, did a wonderful job setting up phone banks, right, to call into legislative offices, emails, letters, uh, joining even our coalition, right, we are now almost 100 strong, um, everyone from education advocates and student rights groups to chambers of commerce and ISDs, 
uh, it was a wonderful, strong coalition we put together and one we'll try to reorganize and see who's able and willing to be a part of a conversation in a special session. And then of course, days of action, right? I think we're looking at what does a teach-in look like, right? Like what does office visits look like? Um, so there's gonna be opportunities for us to continue to make sure that our voices are centered and heard. Ours definitely being black and brown students, right? And teachers and those who are being um, specifically targeted by these bills. And then our internal strategies, right? Office meetings, it helped us tremendously really understand you know, what are they thinking? What, what are our combating? What are we looking at? Um, and then looking at, you know, if you have expertise, can I just say, I just want to give so much thanks and love to um, Mallory, uh, Dr. Caldera, uh, Christopher Carmona, you know, Trinidad, uh, Gonzalez, just so many wonderful professionals who've been doing this work um, to really help us and understand and guide the conversations around curriculum, right? And what true and um, just holistic pedagogies need to look like. Cause that's what we're venturing into, right? We're having this overarching effect, unfortunately. It's not going to just stay in the classroom, right? This is going to harm students. This is gonna harm Texas. Uh, so if you have expertise, right? And you're interested in being involved, if you've, you know, teachers were some of our what, our best advocates and really sharing what this was going to mean to them in their classrooms, um, please feel free to sign up and, and take part. And then grass top phone calls, right? Calling into your members, people you have relationships with, that's going to also help us get across the finish line. And it may not be pretty, but we'll get there together. <laughs> um, next slide. And this is just to talk about a little bit of our coalition work and the coalitions that are activated, right? So thankful for TLEC and this larger coalition that was uh, almost a hundred groups. And then even now teacher groups that are just gathering and asking like, how do we push against this bill? So if you wanna be connected to the work and you'd like to know how you can do that, happy to make sure that that takes place and I can try to help in any way that possible. And the next slide, I think, Yes, and we've highlighted some of these, right? So upcoming actions and needs. We do know that there's a special session, not sure when it's gonna take place. Um, you know, the standards and our first opportunity to understand what's gonna happen in the SBOE will be coming up on June 22nd, so Wednesday of next week. There are coalition meetings almost every Friday and Sunday. So if you're looking to get plugged in um, on a week to week basis, let me know. This is not all around the state level. This is also on the local level and how we can make sure we're protecting teachers and students and families who are unfortunately being targeted. Um, we're looking at what messaging needs look like. I know there's national dialogues going around this, but there's nothing more crucial than understanding what our, our communities are saying around this and how we can make sure we're being good stewards of that. Working on analyzing and understanding 3979, right? This is gonna be an ongoing thing. A lot of this is, here's our favorite word, unprecedented. So <laughs> that'll be a continuing conversation. And then uh, litigation, right? So that's an ongoing conversation. It's been going through, um, I think there's a very famous line from Superintendent Hinojosa, right? I don't like to threaten behind the mic, <laughs> but um, that is gonna continue to be a part of this and, and ongoing conversations around needs and upcoming actions against House Bill 3979 and whatever iteration will come special session. And then I think the next slide is it. So, um, if you're interested in joining the coalition, please, I think Morgan added in a um, the form to let us know. We'll reach out to you directly. And before I forget, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I put in my, um, my cell phone so everyone has it. Feel free to reach out to me. I, I have a bad habit of responding at any time. So Feel free to <laughs> feel free to uh, message me when it's best for you. I understand we're all working on different schedules, and that's my email address. Um, if you'd like to message me or learn more about our coalition work, especially around TLEC and then the coalition against 3979, be more than happy to discuss that and what it looks like. But also filling out that form will be really really helpful. Um, um, do, 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 do. 
No, there's no way that this bill gets better in the special. I'm just looking at some of the questions now. I, unfortunately, I, I'll speak to political landscapes. And again, I'm going to take off my IDRA hat. Um, we're looking at a governor who's being, you know, pushed into a more conservative primary, right? We're looking at a governor who's looking at a 2024 presidential run, right? I think that this bill will unfortunately only get worse and we're going to have to push back as much as we can and set up legislative intent, maybe a potential litigation challenges if, you know, organizations are interested and, you know, oddly, we had success last time. I wouldn't say it was an overarching success. We were able to successfully get these and code at least these these um, things that SBOE has to look at outside of what was traditionally expected for this bill. So um, we're going to take our wins where we can get them, but it's um, I don't imagine it'll get any better. And we have to be prepared for that. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it because got to be ready. <laughs> um, Hmm. That's a good question. You know what, Sergio? You have a great question that we're going to add to our question document. <laughs> Is it even constitutional? Um, if it comes up, right, these are things that we'll have to explore. So I wouldn't, I'm not a constitutional attorney. If there's any on the line, feel free to chime in, or if any attorneys on the line want to chime in. Um, but that's a question I, I do not know. Yes, I, I would agree with Laura. I think that's something that's come up pretty consistently about the vagueness. A lot of, lot of questions about constitutionality to this. Um, with that, I know we're over time and want to be respectful. We did record the session and we'll plan to share out portions of it. Thank you, Laura. That's so cool to be an attorney. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, please fill out that form and we'll be sure to email out to all the participants again, um, you know, information afterwards and do some follow-up and so thankful for everyone's work and continued work on this and we'll see you soon, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks guys.